I almost wanted to title it, Enough is Enough. <laughs> or, Stop in the Name of Love. <laughs> I say to the buyer, Stop in the Name of Love. You can't live in the presence of light and love. Nothing can but that which is of spirit and that which is of, of love itself. So we all have things that we're trying to, that are dealing with that is trying to hold us back. Whether it's guilt from past mistakes, temptations that we can't seem to overcome or a dysfunction that passes down to us. It's easy to learn to accept it and think that's who we are. But God didn't create you to go through life weighted down by addictions, dysfunction, guilt of the past. I'm going to read a scripture from Mirror in Hebrews 12.1. Love the way it's worded. I know in the King James it's a little different, but this is so good. So now the stage is set for you. Feel that. The stage is set for you. All these faith heroes, it says in the, in the King James, it says that we're uh, passed with such a cloud of witnesses. He's talking about those who are no longer with us in the body, who's in the spirit, have gathered together as a sphere of beings to support us. That's what it's talking about. Here it says, calls them faith heroes, cheering us on as if we were like a great multitude of spectators in the amphitheater. This is our moment. As with an athlete who is determined to win, to win it is silly to carry any baggage of the old law system that would weigh us down. Make sure to... Not get your feet clogged up with sin consciousness. Mm -hmm. We know what sin means. Separation. Mm -hmm. uh, become absolutely streamlined in the faith. Run the race of your spiritual life with total persuasion. That says a lot. I could stop and just minister on that, but... The title for this message actually comes from the words that have been written of Jesus' teaching concerning his crucifixion experience found in John 19 and 30. When he said, it is finished. It is finished. That's always fascinated me. For many, many years, what in the world and why did he say in that experience, it is finished. He wasn't just talking about his life and how he had finished his purpose. But he was putting an end to all the negative things that could keep him and us from our destiny. He was saying, in effect, guilt is finished. Depression, you're finished. Low self-esteem that I've lived with most of my life, it is finished. Mediocrity, you're finished. The word here, finish, is one of the few times in translation that the word represents the two tenses at the same time, meaning in a moment of time and into the future. In other words, it's not something that just comes and goes, but it becomes a living state of consciousness. No matter what someone did or didn't do to you, does not change who you were created to be. Breathe that in. No matter what someone did or didn't do to you, does not change who you were created to be. You may have had bad breaks, gone through unfair situations, but it's important you do not have a victim mentality. Have a victor mentality. After all, you're here. Yes, I was molested. Yes, I was raped. Yes, I was done dirty. Yes, I was abused. But you're here. You made it. And you are victorious. You're not a victim. You're victorious. And not only do you carry that story in you, but you carry an ancestral story in you. 
You that come from ancestry of slavery and, and many other, we all have past issues in our, in our ancestral story. I mean, even the Irish had to go through a great tribulation and was discriminated against to come to this country in the beginning. Right? You have that story. They made it. We're here for them because we are victorious. The Bible says that God will pay you back double for the unfair things that has happened to you. Wow, I like that. That person who did you wrong and thought they were hurting you, the truth is they were helping you. They qualified you for a double blessing. <laughs> Second Kings 2.9 says that Elisha said, Please give me a double portion of your spirit. And I found many scriptures when I looked up this double. I, didn't, I never heard of this before. I had to look it up. There's all kinds of scriptures where God is promising to double to Job. Everything that was taken from him, God said, I'll double it back to you. Things such as greed, depression, anger, shame, etc. that have happened in the past or now does not have to define you. I have said many, many times, be careful what you attach to I am. I am sick. I am angry. Be careful with that. that that's an almost an oxymoron. It doesn't work. The I am is never sick. In my Wednesday class in Course in Miracles, I was reading from there that says, if you think you are sick, so God is sick. Now, we may change our way of saying things and say, I'm going through an experience in which I'm having a challenge of an illness or a disease, but never attach I am to it. Because the I am is so powerful that whatever you give to it, the power of the I am goes into it to intensify it and make it stronger. So, maybe you want to say, me sick. <laughs> <laughs> me not feeling well. <laughs> and I'm hearing that for the Apostle Paul has written that he said that the things that I would like to do, I do not the things I should do, I don't do, and it is not, uh, it is only that which dwells in me, but not in the I am that I am. Mm. You can say I am love because God is love. You can say I am peace. All these wonderful things that we said today, these affirmations, was along with I am as something that was spiritual. It was an attribute of spirituality. That's fine. But when you start attaching eagles' labels to them, then you begin to redefine what is the truth. We can all find a reason to live negatively. No, it's not hard. And to think that we're at some disadvantage. So I'd like to take you into John 5, to this wonderful story. It's a great story. I'm going to try to give it to you condensed as I can, but it's about a disabled man. <clears throat> this disabled man had been sick with infirmity for 38 years. But he hung around the pool of Bethesda. The pool of Bethesda was very fascinating. In fact, it still is over in the Middle East. If you look it up, you can see where it was. But it was a pool where all the sick people came there was five different porches. And once in a while, the story goes that an angel would come down and stir the water. And if you got in, you got healed. And for 38 years, this man tried to be the first to get in the water and never made it. Did not make it. So Jesus comes to him and says, do you want to be well? <laughs> really, it says, will you be made whole? 
The fact that Jesus asked him says he saw nothing in his action, behavior, or attitude that said he wanted to get well. Nothing that said, I want things to change for me. That's where your healing begins, is in your attitude, in your words, in your thoughts. The man had a bed. He laid on that bed. He laid on the bed with others who were also sick that was not getting into the troubled waters to be healed. So let's just imagine for a moment. He had a bed. Maybe he had a lamp, some books, some pictures of himself as in when he was young in the past. And you know, I was thinking about this time of the year. If you notice, all of the commercials now go toward buying Vicks, Kleenex. This is flu season. This is the time of cold. And many people will stop by the drugstore and they will get their Kleenex and they will get everything that they need, just like he fixed his, stayed on the bed and fixed his environment from the bed. Time to get your sinus medicine. It's time to get your allergy pills out that you put away last year. And we start doing the very same thing. In other words, we have become too complacent in our dysfunction. We accept things too well. We talk another thing here, but when it comes out to the everyday life, we do not accept what we are saying. There lies the gap. There lies a blind spot in consciousness that the ego is always willing to fill in with its illusions of misinformation. Over the course of 38 years, the man was comfortable in his dysfunction. He, he thought, this is my lot in life. I'm the man laying on my bed at the pool, but never getting better. He was also, again, surrounded by others who were sick, blind, and were afflicted. He gravitated to people who were like him. <laughs> Everyone was needy. Everyone was complaining. Everybody was discouraged. The point is you need to be careful about whom you're surrounding yourself with, especially in difficult times. You may have an illness, but don't find other people to hang out with. Misery loves company. When he came to the place, and he did 38 years, which is all these numbers are symbolic to a, a period of time. But because Jesus came. Now Jesus here metaphysically means the word or consciousness showed up into his consciousness, which was so off. It wasn't toward his healing. Jesus intervened. The word, the Christ consciousness intervened into his mind. And he realized what he was doing at some point. And he finally came to a place to say, it is finished to his excuses when he came to that place then the word came to him get up pick up your bed bed representing the rest the resting in our present condition some of us have just laid down in our condition we lost the fight we've lost the struggle we're just okay this is this is what, the way it is. But Jesus said, get up. It says, arise. Take up your bed and walk. And the word arise there is a very interesting word translated from Greek. And it means collect your faculties. What is your faculties? Your 12 powers. Faith. Willingness. All of these powers that we're going through. We've got one more just left for this year. And we've been through all 12 of them. But he said, get yourself together. Know who you are. Know who you were created to be. Know what your spiritual birthright is. Know what is your right. As an expression of God incarnated in the human experience. Do not let the human experience define you. That's just your experience. 
but it is not who you are. When he finally got up in consciousness, arose in consciousness, and went to that place in himself that was transcendent to what he perceived was happening as a body identity. Now, you Course of Miracles people understand that the only way the ego proves to us its belief in separation is by using our bodies. Because that's the thing that is the most different about all of us. I'm not your body, you're not my body. And that proves we are separate. As long as we only have a body identity. We know the body is not, I, I say, created. I, I've never believed the body is created. And boy, people have disagreed with me that we want to believe that God created our little bodies. No, mom and dad formed them. Hmm? I have 23 chromosomes from my mother, 23 from my dad, came together and started putting together and forming this body I'm in. Bodies come from other bodies. Trust me, if you think that's not right, then you are making the Creator God a failure because the bodies are not at the level that God is. They are inferior to creation. For what a perfect creator creates is perfect. The scripture says, I am perfect because he is perfect. It is your spiritual body that is created whole and perfect at this moment. Your body is trying to catch up. Hmm? That's where the modalities and the teachings coming in of tuning and vibration, resurrection, all of that is for the purpose of the body to enter a state that is equal to creation. And in that moment, form and creation become one new body. Hmm? And then no longer will that perfect body of spirit that's in you right now be imprisoned to an inferior body that is dealing with sickness, illness, and death. And then you're going to go around and say, God created my body. No, it says, I knew you when you were formed in your mother's womb. But I didn't create you. And that's called the spiritual path. You don't need to be on a, spirit doesn't need to be on any path. The spirit has no path to follow. It is that which it is. It is equal to that which created it. It is whole. It is the expression of everything that is creation. But it incarnated, by love incarnated to these inferior bodies and said, now I'm going to stay with you until you raise the outer to fit the inner. The Gnostic Gospel says, Jesus saying that when the inner becomes the outer, the outer becomes the inner, male becomes a female, male, the female, male becomes a female, up becomes down, down becomes up, then you shall see the kingdom of God. Book of Thomas. And that's the thing about Jesus I love as a pattern of the fact that he said, well, it's in me, but you can also touch me. Go ahead, touch me. Because what was in me has become as me all the way to the cellular level. When you've seen this, you've seen my father. He was the pattern to show us the greatest miracle is the miracle at the wedding. You all know that? Bible people should know the first miracle that he did was at the wedding in Cana. And he changed what? Water to wine. Alchemy, exactly. It was the law of alchemy at work. And the new wine that we all carry of God becomes everything that we are. Physically, mentally, emotionally, 
and expresses itself and then we are swallowed up in victory. We are swallowed up mortality into immortality. Now that's my, you, you hold on to whatever you want to do about your creation. But I do not believe anything that, that is not equal to that which God is, is not created. Whether it's computers or cars, they all get faulty. <laughs> because man makes them. And they don't make them at the exact level of consciousness that they are perfect. But most everything in the world can be very dysfunctional. Right? And before I get off of that, let me just say to you, the Bible says in the beginning God created man in his image and likeness. Created he them, male and female, them. They became the Lord God of the earth. Then it says in the next chapter, and the Lord God formed man out of the dust. Create, form. Two different things. Hmm? That's why I'd be very careful about throwing Jesus out. If you're throwing Jesus out, he is your pattern of how to get out of this. He truly is your way shower. Let him show you the way. Uh, when I was doing this, I thought about my, my, my aunt that I mentioned who was my pastor and a great inspiration to my life and my ministry was all under her. She was magnificent. <laughs> she really was a magnificent creature. She wore orchid hat, orchid and a long handkerchief. And there were five inch heels. This is in the 50s when women in this denomination was not allowed to be a minister. Her story was sad, being raised of nine children, the father being uh, taken away to prison, n poor, nine of them living in two, two rooms in Arkansas. No, I've heard a horrible story about her and my mother and others. And she started preaching and ministering and singing, and people said, no, you cannot do that. One, you're a woman. Secondly, what's your credentials? What education do you have? Everything was coming against her to what it is. But there is that something in her that's been passed to me that she became tremendously successful and had the largest church in Tulsa, Oklahoma in our denomination. 99% were men pastors. But this one woman became more successful in the 50s. In spite, she held on to her dream. And to be a successful singer and minister, she got a record contract, did wonderful records with some of the more famous people. And I observed that. Now to me, people, even my parents told me I was too young. Starting to preach at 17 years old. My God, I look at 17-year-old kids and I think, my Lord. I was a child. Told me I was too young, definitely not mature enough, unexperienced, too dyslectic, too skinny, not that talented. But I did not let that define who I knew I was going to become. You have to separate yourself from people who see you only for who they perceive you to be and not for who you're able to become. People who knew you back when will try to keep you in the box that you grew up in and tell you it's better to play it safe. Quickly, one more story I want to... And I love talking about David of the Bible. I love David. Of, of anybody in the Old Testament, David is my, my hero. And I've told you the reason that David is my hero is because of the 19 dynasties of kings of Israel who were all under Old Testament Yahweh, Jehovah, who I have a real problem with. A little erotic. Don't kill. 
Thou shalt not kill. One of the Ten Commandments. Then he says, go kill. Horrible things. But David was the exception. David saw beyond Jehovah or Yahweh of the Old Testament and saw who was a part of the divine that was going to end up fathering the Christ in the future, which was El Elyon. El Elyon in the Hebrew, which means the Most High. It's translated the Most High. David tasted of the age that hadn't come yet. He was tasting of grace when it was still law. And he was so excited about that that he danced a lot. No other king was dancing. David danced his clothes off. His wife had a fit looking out the window and he danced all his clothes off. What a beautiful metaphysical story that he danced all of his persona off. All of his Babylonian garment came off. All of his personality, everything that he was but not created to be fell off of him. And he stood in the authenticity of the nakedness of, of his true self. Some of you need to dance more. Bonnie, you need to get on them and get them up. Show these people how to dance a little bit more. David in 1 Samuel 17 and 12. This is interesting. Now David was a, had uh, seven brothers. He's the eighth. And the story goes that the word of God came to the prophet Samuel. And he said, Samuel, I'm choosing you to go and to find the next king of Israel. And you're going to find it at Jesse's house. Go to Jesse's house, because Jesse has these sons. So David goes to Jesse's house, and all the sons line up. And boy, these were strong men who had worked out, and they were warriors, and they had their armor on. The first one that he came to looked good to him. I believe this guy can handle the job. And God whispers to him and says, this is not he. Okay, the next one. Again, this is not he. Went through all seven of those brothers that looked and was perceived to have done a great job by stature, of being of great stature. And, and, and Samuel is going, what happened? I missed it. I thought I heard the voice of God. And out of desperation, he says to Jesse, is this all? And Jesse says, well, we didn't tell him or mention it, but we got one more son. And he's probably over there playing a harp and talking to the sheep. He's very different. <laughs> he doesn't have the stature of his brothers. He was smaller. And Samuel says, go and get him. And here comes David, little David, compared to the brothers. And it said a couple of things about him that fascinated me. He was, he was beautiful. That means he was probably pretty <laughs> for a young man. But it said he was ruddy. Ruddy. Why? Why am I ruddy? I said, spare what does that mean? And I remember an old story my mother used to tell me that they were so poor growing up that if she met some boy or something like that, she's going to the closet and paint her sheets. Huh? Couldn't afford rouge. So if you think you kind of get, you know, get the blood going up there and get, some of you women may have done that. I don't know. <laughs> Ruddy. Now you've got to remember that David is of the tribe of Judah. You know what Judah means? praise. While the other brothers were out there getting stronger and pumping iron and learning war and, and, and getting big and, and, and all of that out there, David was out there doing his spiritual work. He was in connection and worship with this new God figure called El Elyon. In other words, he had a special spiritual 
healthy countenance about him that was not seen with the other brothers. And it goes on and says, this is he. This is he. So here's all the brothers looking like, wow, are you kidding me? I'm sure I had this in the bag. I've been working hard for this. But the scripture says, man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. That's what God was looking for, the heart. And David was a man after God's own heart. So, the stories tell us that you can't always buy in to how people see you. That does not define you. You are defined by your Creator. It is written in your divine DNA all the possibilities of what you could be. I feel that most of us, if not all of us, right here are living beneath our potentials. I know there is more talent and gifts in this community that we have not seen yet. And the reason maybe that it's not happening is because of old recordings that are going into you when somebody said you're a woman or that you're not smart enough or you're not talented enough or you're not pretty enough. Those things go in and they go deep into the first recording of your root chakra. And whether you think it's happening, those recordings are still playing at a deep level. I'm not saying that everybody is talented to do the same thing, but everyone has a birthright, a gift and a talent and a contribution or you wouldn't be here. So, say to some things next time it comes up, it is finished. Jesus said it is finished. Now, how I used to teach that is that creation has been done. It's finished. It's successful. Celebrate it. Hmm? It's finished. Things don't have to keep getting better spiritually. There's no room to get better or worse Spirit is that which it is. And you've tried 613 laws, and that didn't do it for you, so I hope you've learned that those laws are finished in identifying you. Receive God's grace. And God's grace is, I love and accept you exactly where you are and for who you are in this moment. Sure.